My name is Leora Lanz, and I am pleased to welcome you to a session, a conversation on global perspectives of the hospitality landscape. We're going to talk today about some of the regions of the world that probably get less press coverage in the United States, and they deserve a lot more. And that's why I reached out to some industry friends and colleagues who are important to me personally and are important to our global landscape to talk to us about a few different regions of the world. And we're gonna get started with what I call the elephant in the room. Let's start big and whittle our way down. So here's the big question. When do you think we will see recovery in your respective region of the world? Where the occupancy or the average rates, where we saw those levels in 2019, when do you think it's gonna come back to 2019 levels? I also would love for you to think about some of the markets that have performed better than others, or even the hotel segments that have performed better than others in your region. Hala, can we start with you? Absolutely, thank you. And again, a pleasure to be here. I'm now based in Dubai. I've been Dubai bound since February. I haven't been traveling. So that's where it starts talking about how this industry has been impacted and potential recovery. Um, you know, when looking at recovery, uh, we really have to look at the different markets in the sense of their segmentation, specifically their source of visitation, but more importantly, also what sort of development or demand generators are expected to really help. If I could look at the Middle East and really break it down into the more mature markets, such as Dubai, Abu Dhabi, for instance, Saudi Arabia, maybe down to North Africa, looking at Egypt, they have very different demand characteristics. So when we're looking at the recovery, it's hard to say the Middle East region will recover within three to four years. I'd probably say it's gonna take a good four to five years for any such market to recover and stabilize. We're gonna, we're gonna see markets that will recover ahead of others, such as Dubai, which had postponed the Expo 2020 to 2021. That naturally will help accelerate the growth. Post the event, there could be a decline before the market stabilizes. On the other hand, for instance, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, they're probably looking at a quicker recovery. The real challenge, however, Laura, is that when someone asked me this question three months ago, I was hoping that if we were able to create, let's say specifically in the Middle East or between the GCC, what we call a traffic corridor between the different cities and create a bit of a domestic regional tourism, this didn't happen. Everyone was really hoping for this to happen. And as we speak today, Saudi Arabia hasn't opened its airport yet for international or regional travel. Again, the recovery is ought to happen. I mean, the industry has faced a lot, but this time around, the dependency on so many variables just making it more difficult. Just, you know, on this idea of recovery, again, there is huge potential in the Middle East because we were just about to promote the Middle East to position it on the map to create those attractions that people would want to come and travel. And we've seen double digit growth into the Middle East region. With that said, however, it's going to be some time to see that full recovery. And my real concern is that some markets may not necessarily recover to what we would call 100% recovery. It could take much longer. Similar fashion to, I'm sure what my the other panelists will probably share, similar fashions to what every continent is really facing, except that perhaps some markets or some countries are more established when it comes to leisure tourism, potentially domestic tourism, which really helps uh, bridge those periods of uh, lower occupancy. Yes, and I, I think we're going to hear more about domestic tourism as we continue the conversation. So that's, it's, this is tough news to hear, but realistic, likely, and based on what, you know, you're seeing right there, you're, you're on the ground there. So I'm sure you're, you're seeing that. But thank you for clarifying. We really can't sort of bundle the Middle East as one location, can we now? Which is something that I think we tend to do. Right. Right. And uh, again, I mean, there are a couple of mature markets for sure, but it is not necessarily about the product offering at this stage. Again, when we're looking at what this crisis has caused, it is not necessarily just about how well the government has been able to, to handle the crisis or what has been put in place. I mean, if you allow me a few seconds, for example, to, to bring in the, the, the what Emirates have done in terms of providing uh, health insurance for everyone who travels through Emirates, also in the way the, the, the UAE has really managed with the crisis. They've probably been uh, ranked among the top countries to uh, contain, to test, to 
However, and they built obviously in the minds of a lot of travelers, a lot of confidence in the way what the UAE has to offer. That didn't necessarily translate in someone actually getting on a flight and traveling. So the decision making has become much more challenging beyond what traditionally, especially from a marketing standpoint, you'd say, put the right product at the right price point to the right target market, and here you go, you've got, you, you've got to succeed. It is much more challenging at the moment with really trying to see where the end of this, will the vaccination help, will it not, and what recovery could look like in the next couple of years. Fair enough. And we'll, we're going to talk more about governmental support and aid in a few minutes as well. Juan, what about in the Caribbean, which of course is a, an aggregate of so many different countries, island countries that rely so heavily on tourism? What have you been seeing? Oh, well, as Hala said, um, unfortunately, we do not have local tourism. Um, I, I'm, I can make an example inside the the Emirates, you know, Ras Al Khaimah is still, you know, a weekend destination for people that live in Dubai, right? And they can drive to Ras Al Khaimah. Um, some of these islands don't have that. The bigger islands like Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, uh, do have a little bit of in-country in, in tourism, but it is very small. They rely 90% on external tourism, if not 95 or 98. So very small local tourism, heavily reliant or dependent completely on airlift. What happens with American Airlines, United, Delta, Southwest, WestJet, any, um, any um, North American carrier towards the islands is determined and it's a make it or break it for each one of these islands. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, for example, last week, Copa Airlines out of Panama, the hub of the, what they call the hub of the Americas, uh, restarted flights to some islands. Um, some islands have done different things. Uh, some islands have said we're open. Some islands have said we're open and then we're closed. Uh, some have been more consistent. The Dominican Republic, for example, said every tourist that lands here will have health insurance, repatriation insurance. So confidence automatically went up, airlift went up, and that means tourism restarted. Um, there's some success stories and there's some islands that do not have the hospital capacity to uh, treat more cases than their own. So they have had to be a little more uh, stringent with the lockdowns. Then we have the other islands that depend a lot from European travelers, the um, old colonial uh, affiliations, the ABC islands with the Netherlands, uh, the French uh, government with the French uh, Caribbean islands, um, so we're having a lot of very interesting movements going on. Recovery, TBD. Um, I wish I could be, you know, as up, you know, more optimistic than Hala, but she knows better, right? Like she is giving the clients the advice. We are seeing some very interesting trends um, in other parts of the Caribbean because I consider Cancun in Mexico the Mexican, the Mexican Caribbean, okay. which, for example, has seen over 300 flights every week um, coming in. And I'm talking about full planes coming in from the US and from other, other regions in the world, which it is a very good indicator of how that is going to be. But other major airports that had plenty of airlift have yet to restart uh, their operations. Um, we're seeing some confidence in the bookings post Thanksgiving, uh, which is the, you know, Thanksgiving in the US and then for the uh, holidays at the end of the year, Christmas, uh, Hanukkah, um, and good sentiment and uptick. Um, but everything is dependent on a vaccine and people feeling uh, that it is safe to travel again. As a hotel company, we've done everything we can so that when travelers want to travel, they feel safe in our hotels. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a health crisis coupled with a financial crisis that der derives from risk crisis. So you have a loss, you know, you have a loss of health or a perception of unhealthiness, and then you have the um, financial crisis uh, right behind us of loss of jobs, loss of benefits, which also is hindering the recovery. So I'm hopeful Hala's prediction comes true and I will knock on wood that that happens. Hopefully I am surprised, knock me with a feather, right? So. Um, looking forward to the recovery and to being a little bit more optimistic. But I can tell you the countries that have been firm in their policies 
are seeing an uptick in sentiment and travel booking. And that's, a, that's good. And, you know, similar to Hala's response, and Hala, you were saying four to five years to be realistic in terms of returning or hopeful return to 2019 Aachen rate levels. Juan, are you thinking that Mexico or some other destinations, again, we can't bundle the Caribbean holistically, like we can't do that for the Middle East. We shouldn't be doing that for the Middle East. It's, it's, re it's country by country, destination by destination. Do you think some, maybe Mexico may see something a little bit sooner than maybe, you know, yes. the Eastern Caribbean? Definitely, yes. Uh, I got some data from China yesterday at the Golden Week uh, this week coming up for travel. We were going to see similar levels of occupancy to the past year, which, you know, it is very encouraging, right? Call it green spouts, call it whatever you want to be. Uh, but Mexico, I treat it as, a, as an additional state because the, the U.S. traveler is very comfortable going to Mexico. Um, uh, BCS, Baja California Sur, uh, Los Cabos, uh, Puerto Vallarta, Cancun. Um, it is almost a destination for, you know, it is almost a local destination for, for most U.S. travelers, mid, you know, Midwest and East Coast and West Coast for Los Cabos. So I am hopeful some markets will recover earlier. Um, it is, you know, yes, there will be some markets that will recover earlier than others. And I think that, I think we're, we're just, we're just seeing, and again, 2019 was a banner year, right? So we, we're putting the threshold really high on a, what I, what I call That's a true. not stable year. We're putting, we're, we're calling it, you know, the, the, like the peak. Um, and that was a great year. It was a banner year, but you know, hospitality has cycles. So we have our ups and we have our downs. Where is the stable, the stable point to call it recovery? I would endeavor to say it could be 2016. Um, and that is, if we were looking at 2016 levels, could be 2023, could be 2022 even. Um, time, will, uh, time will tell. You know, I always say economy is the science that tells us in which moment of the history we made a mistake. And <laughs> I'm going to continue with that position. Well, I also think that's a really great wake up call for all of us because all we've been hearing is when do we get back to 2019? But in fact, that was a peak of a cycle. And so where, where, where should the benchmark truly be? So I appreciate you raising that question. And Machachi, you know, in, in your neck of, of the world, your part of the world, there's lots of different countries. So I can't even imagine your response here, but in terms of when can we be back to a, a recovery of levels that we appreciated in the past? What do you see among the various countries who, who you work with? First of all, um, Leora, thank you very much for, for inviting me uh, to share this space with the colleagues and Hala and Juan on the other side. Well, I think when we talk recovery for our part of the world, uh, I think, uh, Leora, it's a little bit of a, it, 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 it's a bit of a difficult thing to do because you know, right now, you know, we are kind of worried, you know, when we were going to winter, knowing very well that our winters across much of Southern Africa is traditionally uh, low season. We don't have much of activity, especially on the international front. But now, you know, there is the fact that the Northern Hemisphere is now going into winter and the infection rate is rising in some of our key source markets, like in the U.S., uh, in the U.K. and France. And suddenly the U U.K. the other day just lifted their lockdown levels back to level four. And so for us in the southern part of Africa, especially you talk in South Africa, even as far as when you look at Kenya, you know, we very much, our key source markets are now having the barriers up. So when you start talking about recovery, you start saying, what are you talking about? You know, because your key source markets are now being locked down to be able to travel. So it's a bit of a difficult thing to be able to project and focus when the recovery is going to happen. South Africa just opened, uh, allowed international flights to come in from the 1st of October. And so I was just watching uh, the news just to find out what, which airlines came in. And Lufthansa was the first airline to touch uh, at Johannesburg International Airport. And funny enough, it was full. And Emirates was the first to touch in Cape Town. And we were looking forward to get uh, Emirates and Qatar to touch down in Durban, which is the three major cities in South Africa, uh, which have been allowed to open up for international travel. But now the latest news this afternoon on Saturday was that because the South African authorities, which are taking their guidelines from the WHO, has, is now treating the cabin crew as part of normal passengers. When they arrive, they want them to be quarantined. You know, the airlines have now canceled all their flights coming back. So it's a to and fro. And if you ask me to look at, at and then what is the South African story got to do with the rest of the region? We are so intertwined as a region. You know, a South African package 
or a traveler, a leisure traveler who travels to Southern Africa, they really will not do Victoria Falls and not include the Kruger National Park package or a Cape Town package. You know, so, so we are very much intertwined as a region, so people travel between, and for the tourists, they really couldn't care uh, about this political boundary. So we are so intertwined in terms of our recovery. And, and, and so we, we then, as South Africa, when we went down to level three, we begin to allow uh, what we call domestic interprovincial travel, you know, people who travel between the states. And only on the, from level two and level one, we are now allowing international travel, but it's going back and forth. And what is that to do? What, what is it doing to the hotel industry? Um, as you can imagine, the Southern, the, the Southern African product, Hala, uh, Hala and uh, will, will, will back me on this one, Leona, I did explain the other day when we were doing our preparation to say, you kind of have a mixed product offering. You have your traditional hotels, so hospitality, which is mainly in major centers of Johannesburg, of Cape Town and Durban. So that is a different project that you're looking at because there you're looking at a business community. And so what, what has been going on, we've been seeing uh, the hotels in the urban areas you're filling up, you know, people traveling both uh, domestically and regionally, and, and, and a bit of international beginning to come in as well. The leisure is where everybody's very concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, the industry is now going back to, 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 to the government here in South Africa and in Namibia and Botswana and across the region, asking governments to relax the restriction further. And, and, and now the government is facing the public saying, hey, listen, you are not going to bring down the borders. Remember where this thing started. The South African uh, infection of COVID-19 started with 10 people who traveled to Italy and they came back and it all spread from there. And so you have a little bit of a government trying to balance what business are looking for, the recovery of our economy, and also balance the public sentiment. And it's a bit of a difficult one. So the projection that we're having within South Africa, which is very much, uh, as you can imagine, is one of the strongest economy in the region. So if South Africa is doing very bad, the rest of the region is also very, doing bad. Less. So we're very much intertwined in that regard. So we, 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 we were not expecting to get travel especially international, to come in before December. But with the lifting to going back to level one and allowing international flights to come in, you know, we, we're thinking that some numbers will come in. But uh, uh, Aliora, it's not going to do much. We are looking to, to 2021, at least minimal uh, recovery, uh, but then looking to the rest of 2021. But again, like Hala is saying, two to three years, four years recovery because of this back and forth story. Northern Hemisphere going into winter, we're into summer, and that, that is the, the kind of thing that makes it difficult to do the focus. You know, Machachi, it's interesting, and I hope I'm understanding this piece correctly, because here what we're seeing in the United States is the emergence of some leisure business and, and uh, destinations and hotels relying on the leisure business where we're not seeing the corporate travel. But did I hear you correctly in saying in South Africa, you're sort of seeing the opposite, actually. You're yes. seeing some of that business travel return, but it's the leisure travel that's been more hesitant. Absolutely. So what we, when we went down to level two, uh, actually, level three, when, when governments started to allow uh, inter uh, local flights, domestic flights to begin to move around in South Africa. So the business community began to travel. And this is what brought up, you know, the minimal recovery of hotel occupancy. You know, we're talking between 20 to 30 percent occupancy that we see. And that is in the major centers uh, where that is happening. The leisure travel is very, very slow. People are, even though people are tired of hibernating in their, their, their homes for the five the lockdown, you know, we had the first real uh, emergence of a bit of recovery on the domestic front is when this past long weekend, we had a, a heritage long holiday long weekend where people ventured out uh, into your surrounding areas, the Kruger National Park and all that, but very consecutive people, you know, trying it out, not knowing whether to go out, whether to stay home, but at least people were willing to go out. And so we're looking forward now on the domestic level to see what happens in this December. And so what I picked up in this week is that a lot of the bookings, especially in the national parks, because can, Southern African product, as you know, we're very much safari, uh, not as sophisticated in terms of city, urban uh, kind of a product like what you have in the US, what you have in Dubai, for instance. So a lot of our people, when they go out uh, in long weekends in December, we all want to go into the beach. We all want to go to the safari area. So we, the bookings for December are looking very good. And, and that is one of the beautiful thing about our part of the world, especially for South Africa. It's not necessarily the same story for the rest of the region. We do have a strong domestic uh, uh, travel. And this, this is what is helping the industry to recover. But what complicates the matter, uh, Leora, which is one thing I know you're going to raise later on, is that our safari industry 
that is South Africa, that is Namibia, Botswana, uh, Kenya, all the way. It's very sophisticated. It's a luxury product, 10 bedded kind of establishment uh, that are usually out of the bounds of the reach of a lot of our people. Those are the ones that are suffering at the moment uh, because they are, their customer is traditional the internet, the American traveler, the German traveler, the French traveler, or the UK traveler. You know, it's, it's fascinating to hear all this. We, we've, we've heard from each of you a little bit about airlift and some of the challenges with airlift in your respective regions of the world and, and bringing in passengers. Uh, we've heard a little bit about the market segments or some of the countries that might be faring a little bit better than others at this time. I, I want to talk about government support um, in terms of, of the hospitality industry, because that's also been a hot topic here in the United States. But Hala, have you, in certain countries um, that you uh, work within, what kind of government support? We heard a little bit about some of the healthcare benefits. Could you maybe talk on that a little bit? And, and was there any other sort of in, uh, insight or input rather infusion of support from the governments from different countries? Well, uh, Laura, there were a number of initiatives definitely in the GCC, much more than when we look at the rest of the Middle East and potentially North Africa. So in the GCC, uh, the UAE, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they had a very generous three-month incentive uh, to both uh, the hospitality sector owners, operators, but also to support the employees. I mean, what's also important to mention here is when we look at what the impact of uh, the travel ban and the lockdown meant is that a lot of people were laid off in this part of the world. 90% of the labor market is people that are uh, from other parts of the world. Uh, and therefore, with the travel ban in place, these people couldn't even leave to go home. So you have a situation where actually you've laid off someone, but you still have to look after that individual and you have to pay those individuals and make sure they eventually travel safely back home, which was only in July. So it took a good five months until the airport opened up. So what these governments have done actually is between, I think it was April to June, it was a three month period where they put a number of incentives in place. And they, they were quite supportive. Uh, from an owner's perspective, this is really, uh, this is little in comparison to, the, to closing down the property. We, we had close to 80%, I think, you know, when we did our research to look at the status of hotels, 80% were shut down, or some of them were transformed into quarantine facilities. But the, these were helping at that moment in time, what I think now the industry realize and also governments are starting to realize, and that's probably where every government is having to strike the right balance between lockdown and containing and dealing with COVID, but also allowing the economy to recover, uh, is that uh, it wasn't just enough to do a three months incentive. It had to be a much more, um, a longer incentive plan that helps both the owners, but also equally the individuals who are in this country. And again, keeping in mind that a lot of people, this is not home for them. So it just makes it even more difficult. Other countries, they didn't have the budget. I mean, we all know how much the medical bill is high for governments. That on one hand, adding to that, giving incentive, whether it comes in the, in the, in, in the form of waiving off certain fees or actually in Saudi Arabia, I know the government had committed to paying 50% of employees' salaries, and so did Bahrain. So these are really very large, uh, large bills. Which again, you know, back to what Wad was saying earlier on, uh, you know, if we just assess how much has happened between February and today, and we don't know how long more, that will have a, a severe financial burden, which will impact corporate travel and will impact further the recovery because even if people wanted to, whether they, they will be able to is another question altogether. Um, so overall, I would probably say only a few countries have been really supportive, but that is on the back also that perhaps they have the ability, the financial capability to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. You know, Juan, in the Caribbean, these countries don't necessarily have those kinds of funds um, for support, and I'm not sure how that would have uh, manifested. What have you seen in some of the countries? Was there that kind of ability? Yeah, yes, there was There was a kind of ability. I think some of the governments uh, took the option. We have a lot of um, government-owned hotels um, in the Caribbean, um, island nations that wanted to boost uh, tourism via conferences and getting to know, example, Barbados, Trinidad, um, 
in and in, in, in the past years have transitioned to private ownership, uh, of course, but it, they were created uh, much like in the U.S. and some other places by government initiatives in order to bol bolster um, tourism and conference coming in. And you know, once you get the corporate traveler in, then you get them for leisure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of them have been able to react faster than others. Um, some of them just, you know, were lucky that they didn't have a lot of um, a, a lot of contagion. Some of them don't have enough testing to do it, so they don't know. Um, it's been said that the virus transmits in colder climates faster uh, by the experts. So we have the privilege of having, you know, tropical tropical weather. We just don't know how much the bill is. I don't know how much, the bill is not due yet, right? So we don't, we really don't know. Um, but, you know, again, I will point out again to the, uh, to the government of the Dominican Republic, which has done an outstanding job in giving confidence to the consumer. At the end, we're in the business of giving, of, of trust, right? People purchase our goods and services when they feel like we're adding value and that what we are adding has value to them. So if you give confidence to the consumer, the consumer tends to spend if you don't ask the consumer to spend, that's why marketing is, 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 is key here, right? Like how do you market a safe destination? How do you market that so that the consumer purchases it? We, we just don't know. I, to be honest, we don't know how much the bill is due, but hopefully it will not be as high, um, as, high as, as some people want, to, you know, want, to, want us to believe and it will be, you know, it, we, we, will, we will recover faster. Thank you, Juan. Machacha, I'd love for you to share um, maybe just an additional uh, example of government support in another country. And then to be honest, there are lots of questions coming to me through the chat. So I'm going to interject with some of our uh, questions that are coming in from the folks who are watching us right now too. And I do have some other questions that we want to chat about too. But any other example that you want to share, Machachi, about another country maybe in the region with some support and what they might have done or tried to do? Yeah. Yeah, just very quickly. I think, uh, you know, like what Juan was saying, you know, the government in, in, in Africa as well, you know, because they don't have, the economies are, don't, are not of the same size, don't have the same abilities. So you are finding the bigger countries like Nigeria, Kenya and South Africa, being able to put some more uh, incentives or, um, you know, out to uh, help business. So for instance, the airlines in South Africa, and I know that it happened in Kenya, uh, the, the, the airlines did not have to pay the normal uh, meteorological fees. Um, you know, there was a, the South African Weather Service, you know, uh, you know, gave a relief for the airlines to continue flying. You know, they were also assisted with, with uh, for instance, South African Airways were assisted with the repatriation flights. And, and, and I must say in South Africa, uh, Leora, uh, we found the South African government, uh, you know, had introduced earlier on a, a $30 billion dollar a relief package that was really spread out across the entire business community. But specifically for the South African the tourism industry, there was a tourism relief fund that our Minister of Tourism put out to really help some business. It was not much, but it did help, especially to operate some small businesses in that regard. And then of course, we had, uh, South Africa has got a, a, a relief fund called the Solidarity Fund that it really has been able, again, over and above the 500 the, uh, billion rand that went in from government, you know, business can, could tap into those funds. And as well as, you know, I, I had one talking about the issue of, uh, of uh, quarantine. Um, you know, again, you know, government used uh, most of the hotels, especially in the cities near the airports to really as quarantine facilities. So I know, for instance, that the hotel that I look after, the, the Radisson Hotel in, in Port Elizabeth, we, you know, it's been able to, to stay open, whereas uh, all of our neighbors in the beachfront in, in Port Elizabeth were closed, simply because we were receiving quarantine business from the government. So there's been those widespread measures that had come in, and I know it happened in, as I said, in the bigger, stronger countries, but I know it happened in Namibia and in Botswana as well, but it's a bigger economist that you find the biggest impact. Super. If, I, if I may, Machachi, that, that's what I meant when we don't know what the bill is due, right? The governments have been pumping in money uh, from government budgets into the economy, for be it for um, labor and unemployment, being to support tourism. But at the end, the middle class has been the one that's most affected, which is the one where you raise your taxes in order to recover that money. That's why I mean when I, when I say the bill is not due yet, and we don't know what the effect is. Other governments, for example, the U.S. are launching the package in, in governments, Barbados, Trinidad, they all launch uh, packages to support it. But at the end, they're going to have to come, that money needs to come back to the coffers. You can, you know, print debt. 
and then somebody needs to buy it, right? So we, we have a health crisis and then we have a recession that is either coming or is, well, it's, it's already upon us, but, but we, somehow those incentives are gonna need to be put back in the coffers. And the way to do that is when, that's when we get the bill in the restaurant, please the check, right? And we're gonna see, oh my God, here it is, how much it's gonna be. It has helped in the, in the interim because we all thought this was transitory. It was really three months, four months, five months. We're now in month six. And the debt is already in, uh, sorry, Leora, just to add to what uh, Juan is saying. We're already, before, you know, the middle class has to fork out the bill, you know, we're already, countries are approaching the IMF. I mean, the, the South African public were up in arms because our government went to uh, the your IMF and asked for money. And South Africans are saying, hey, hello, our economy is in trouble. You're going to look for more money? You're going to settle us with this bill for the next five years? We are very unhappy. So <laughs> it's a yeah. pity of it. This is a big lesson in economics, isn't it, now, to see how we get through this. Um, let me just share, I'm looking into the chat. Uh, it sounds like, Machachi, there's a number of folks on the line from your country, so greetings from countrymen. Um, there's a question here, there's a few questions here. Hala, I'm gonna address you first with one of the questions that's coming in here. And so we've got a question that says, the impact of the, quote, jewel of the creek, the master plan in Dubai, Will, what will that impact have on the global recovery, perhaps even encouraging some air travel? Could you share what that is and, and fill us in on, on what your thoughts are there? I mean, to be honest, Laura, uh, uh, this is one other uh, massive development in Dubai, uh, and it will most certainly uh, induce uh, potentially new demand rather than take away from uh, established segments. That was planned pre-COVID and uh, still going forward. I wouldn't necessarily be able to really to tie it to recovery. I'm not sure this project in particular will, uh, will necessarily uh, impact recovery or the air traffic. However, in Dubai specifically, and it's interesting one also we spoke about earlier on, to what point in time are we comparing? And specifically because this Dubai, uh, this question relates to Dubai, I want to bring this up, that in 2019 and 18, probably from 2016, Dubai, in terms of the hotel performance has been declining. Yes, there is more tourism, but there is definitely much more supply. And perhaps because so much has been happening in the last two years, at least in this part of the world, we tend to forget. But last summer and last corporate season, we didn't benefit as much in the UAE and particularly Dubai because Saudi has gone out to launch their vision and they have been very aggressive in actually starting development and making enough noise to create uh, attraction and the, what that meant a lot of people were traveling to Saudi that typically would come to Dubai so there was already regional competition and this is likely to continue adding to that what has happened in particular Dubai as well as much as it's a well-balanced destination of attracting both the corporate but also the leisure markets in my personal view and that's something that you know at the number of events we have been voicing is that there is now, we are at a point when there is an oversaturation of any asset class, whether it's the hospitality, the retail, the F&B. And one other development, yes, it's great, but my view is at one point, and my point in time is 2016, 17, is where Dubai had everything any traveler would dream for. But since then, we continue to grow and develop. And my concern, similar to one earlier on, who's going to pay for all this? It is also making it a much more expensive destination. We don't pay taxes, but we do pay it indirectly. So at the end of the day, everything like going out, staying at hotels is, is, is inflated. And as a result of that, other more affordable destinations will gain popularity. So I would hate to say this is not going to make even Dubai more beautiful. I mean, it's great to arrive in a destination where you're spoiled for choice, but you know, at this point in time, there is enough offering in Dubai. I'm not sure this will really move the needle in the middle of what we're going through at the moment. And I tend to wonder, based on what you just shared, how many markets may have had an oversupply situation where now they're going to feel it. So the recovery could Absolutely. take a little bit longer. Yeah. Thank you, Hala. Juan, there's a question for you here in terms of um, Puerto Rico specifically. Apparently, Puerto Rico has one of the strictest restrictions among the U.S. mainland and territories about COVID. How do you think this is going to affect, in the long run, the tourism industry for the island? 
can tell you we've we've spoken at length with uh, everybody in the Puerto Rico Tourism Administration, the Invest in Puerto Rico Administration, and I can tell you they are very much looking forward to getting this back on track. Um, unfortunately, Puerto Rico has had so many hits. I mean, they have not yet recovered from Maria, from the hurricane, and now this, right? So um, they're working very hard to get it back. Um, they have the hospital capacity, they have the pharmaceutical capacity, they have, they have everything, but they're still recovering from a devastating hurricane in terms of infrastructure, in terms of electricity, in terms, in terms of everything. Um, and the tourism industry is vital to the island. Um, they are working on it. We are partnering with them. We've had a huge presence in Puerto Rico. Our first hotel outside of the US back then in 1953 was the Caribbean Hilton, which is still like the, the icon of, in the Caribbean for hospitality. Um, we owned it until 2013 when we spun it off to our, um, to our spin off uh, company, Parks, Hotels, and Resorts. And we are working very hard on getting that back on track and back, back on working, right? The employment that hospitality and, and tourism generates in Puerto Rico is among the biggest. The WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, was going to celebrate this past 2020 their annual conference in Puerto Rico. Um, so, there, there is there is a lot of reliance on on tourism. They are working very hard to get it back open safely because it is a drive-in destination for the U.S. As you do not need a passport to travel to Puerto Rico, so of course um, we need to. It, it's my hope is that it, before the holidays, it will be back uh, back on track. Thank you, Juan. Machachi, there is a question for you here as well from uh, among the folks who are attending and listening in right now. And there's actually a comment, it might be from someone who's a colleague of yours as well, saying that in South Africa, the Minister of Environmental Affairs has also given the aviation industry some relief from April through uh, April until the end of March, 2021, where the airlines don't have to pay those exorbitant fees to the South African Weather Service, I believe. So is that something that you're familiar with, I would imagine? and in a ways that the government is trying to help as well. Absolutely, I mentioned it earlier on when I was giving yeah. you some relief. Uh, this is in addition to the unemployment relief for employers. And so they're also helping the airlines as well, Leora. Yeah, so it's a colleague of mine, so Dimisani. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome to, welcome to BU School of Hospitality. And the, the question that is for you here, uh, Machachi, is the, uh, you talked about safaris, and of course, it's, the safari itself is always a bucket list trip for, for many Americans. Is there thought of the various countries collaborating, whether with its, the airlines? There's, there's some sort of a safari conglomerate or uh, association that can actually work together to try to assist in that particular niche of the business? Yeah, Leon, I saw the, I'm, I'm also watching the chat box as well. So. It, it's, it's very much uh, you know, welcome this, this idea, but I think the difficulty here, Laura, as I mentioned in my intro, is that uh, the, 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 the countries in, in, it can collaborate and, and you know, it's not necessarily the countries, it's going to be a private sector drive, which exists. I mean, we have one of the strongest, uh, you know, uh, businesses that operates and send tourists into, into Southern Africa is the African Travel Association, for instance. Uh, there's many of them that are, that are doing that business. The biggest stumbling block, Leora, is always going to be the government. You know, remember earlier on, I mentioned the fact that the major key source market for South Africa, for Namibia, for Botswana, for Mozambique, for, 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 for Kenya, as far as Kenya, it's very much a lot of the, Euro, the Eurozone countries, the UK, France, Germany, Netherlands. So as long as the barriers for travel are up in those countries where they're prohibiting their, their citizens to travel to, to this part of the world uh, because they've got infections in their own space and therefore, you know, there's that to and fro. So governments will always be at the center of whatever it is to, to either allow or block that kind of initiative. But it is something that the private sector, uh, you know, are talking about and say, how do we bridge this gap? You know, how do we, you know, remember earlier on I mentioned that the likes of Emirates, they are now withdrawing the flights back into, into our part of the world because of the restrictions that have been put now their crew are now being treated as ordinary uh, passengers. And so therefore, it's no longer free if they, they're not free to be able to come. And you, you gotta also understand, Leora, that it's a difficult balancing act for the government. You know, what do we do? You know, how do we, how many do we, arrive, we do allow and what are the restrictions we place? You know, I'll give you an example. Namibia, 
uh, they were the earliest ones to open the, the, the borders uh, to international travel. And they literally allowed and said, people can come in, come with this, you know, come go straight to your, your lodge, wherever you booked it. And within five days, you must give us a certificate to come back. Yet the flights didn't arrive. So it is something the private sector is looking at, Leora, but it's going to be, what are the restrictions? What can they do? This Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, so we need to bridge that divide to, to make sure we restore travel uh, back to normality, whatever that, what normal mix means. The new normal, right, Machachi? The new normal. Um, mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I, I can't believe how this conversation is flying because we could really go on. We've got just about 10 minutes left. I, I do want to ask um, my colleagues here, do you think this pandemic is going to bring out permanent changes in the industry? Uh, this new normal that Machachi just referred to, is there anything you see in the changes that we've been making so far in these seven months that you think is going to remain part of our business and part of our landscape? Um, I know, Hala, when we chatted, we talked about the mice market. If you could talk about the meetings, incentives, conventions market, or are there other things, other aspects of the business that you think might be a permanent change? Well, I mean, perhaps when we say permanent change in the sense that it will never exist, uh, but my view definitely is that there are two segments that will be challenged, and therefore it's going to be also a question of quantifying how much of this business is lost and also looking at how are we going to replace the business. Because when we speak earlier on about a recovery model, a recovery model assumes that you know, if you were doing 100 rooms, you're going to do again 100 rooms in four years' time. My, my thoughts are that we will lose certain segments, specifically in the meetings and incentives, perhaps less so when it comes to the social gathering, especially in this part of the world. It may continue, but the traditional meetings and incentives, corporate meetings specifically, but also when we look at the commercial and corporate travel. I mean, there are a number of reasons. One is naturally the, the corporation's budgets, which it will take also time to rebuild and to be able to spend in ways that they used to spend previously and whether also to justify those expenses. So that is on one hand. On the other hand, also us as human beings realizing that there is a lot that can be done, whether, you know, whether we wanted to get on Zoom or not, we are on Zoom and we're able to connect on, to the world in many ways that we weren't in the past. I mean, I've been attending conferences with 2000 attendees and when it used to be a physical attendance, we at best it would capture six, seven, eight hundred. Now, that's not to say that we will not travel anymore for business meetings. We will not travel to hold events. We will. But this is a change that I'll probably say the GMs and also when we look at how these new hotels, who are they going to cater to, you know, the, the offering, the product offering and the positioning, really it's important to understand what the future traveler will want to travel for. My own theory is when we travel less for work, we will travel more for leisure. Leisure could take the form of beach destinations, could take the form of safari, it could take the form of wellness. But we will actually do more of what we enjoy and less of work. So these are the sort of permanent changes when it comes to segmentation. I also think that moving forward, and that's something we've started observing, not just with COVID, but prior to COVID, is how are we building and designing hotel? How flexible are we? How flexible are we to be able to react to COVID or any future disruption, because the last 10 years has been full of disruption. I mean, when we look at technology disruption to the hospitality industry, and now we look at the pandemic and tomorrow something else might come up. It is that flexibility because once built, this is a heavy real estate investment. And I think the mindset is what has changed forever, be it the mindset of the traveler, the mindset of the investor, the mindset of the consultant. And it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. I mean, I wouldn't claim today to know the answers to all of this, but at least that we are now starting to think differently and really trying to understand how it will shape in the future and how are we going to adjust accordingly in order to make sure that we're able to replace the lost business with a new business or at times perhaps even create this new business. It may not exist. We may, we may need to create it. So there's going to be a lot of thinking and, you know, we have to look at it positively because you know, we are where we are today. There is no going back, in my opinion, to whatever it is. It could be better what we're walking into, but it's going to be different. Yes, and I'm someone who also very much preaches, I do not believe in going back to normal. I believe in moving ahead to what we create. So I, I agree on that. Absolutely. Juan, 
Hilton's Stay Clean initiative, is that something that will stay permanent? Uh, yes, I, 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 I think so. Um, I, I truly think so. It's, you know, I, one of the things that I agree with Hala is that it's going to change, but we are already replacing business, right? We have now the work, the work at the hotel type of situation where you have people renting out whole floors of hotel and putting their each individual employee in the hotels. We have hotel credits for M4 companies, which previously was called the WeWork, right? And you can rent a room for the day um, if you have children at home or you want to have, you know, a full day of, you know, silence. You have a hotel room. You can even take a sneaky nap in the middle of the day, right? And, you know, you can refresh, you can go to the gym, you can order room service. Our industry is changing. Is clean stay going to stay? Yes, it is going to stay. I think, I think people, customers will, 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 will demand a higher level even of what we currently had, what we had and what we currently have. Cleanliness is going to continue being a key um, offering that hotels offer. Same thing with, with, um, with airplanes and, and, and travel in general. Um, do I think that we will be frenetically putting hand sanitizer in our hands? I really hope not. It, they're really starting to crack, right? <laughs> and, and another thing is, you know, while it's not customary, you know, in, 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 in other countries, in Latin America and in Hispanic or Latin cultures, you know, if we were here, uh, if we were in a conference next week in Sahit Lior and I would be hugging each other, right? right? Um, I do think that human connection is not going to, and this is my personal opinion, we're not going to not go back to it, but it is going to be less liberal. Um, is the shaking hand going to continue? Hope not. I really didn't like it, but, but that was just me. It, it, but it is, a, it is a sign that we've created. In, when SARS happened in Mexico, for example, the employees went and created a gesture to welcome people, which is the hard, hand and heart and a small courtesy, right? And people love it. And it is not that they're being purchased. They do not want to shake your hand, right? And it's just a gesture of, of a welcome, right? So I think we're going to, you know, humanity always finds a way to improve with, you know, with everything that happens. And I really expect that it will continue this way. Um, we are already creating new business. We're already innovating. Um, and we're already giving the consumers and the customers what they have requested for a long time which is, you know, less time here, less time there, streamline processes, give me more control, let me choose my room, let me favorite my room. All of that that hotel companies are investing in in technology does not take away from the hospitality experience that you were accustomed to see. It's just enhancing it and modifying it. Um, we're advancing. Who, who thought that we would be able to have our credit cards and our phones and now we don't even, I don't even carry my wallet or cash for that matter, right? So let's think positive and that we're, we will, we will come back even better than we were before. Perfect. Perfect. And, you know, for a positive note, and we only have a few minutes left, Machachi, let me just have you ask, answer that last question. And then I want to get into real quick for our wrap up for each of you to share some thoughts with our students in terms of some words of wisdom that you may share because we're thinking about this longer recovery. But Machachi, you and I, speaking of innovation um, and technology, we talked about technology as being a change, something that we'll see more of. And from your seat where you are right now, do you want to just add another comment on that? Some thoughts on, on technology? You know, I think for us, uh, as I mentioned, on we, we as a as a region uh, in in the world, we sell a combination of uh, offerings. So the big change for me that uh, is coming in, it comes with technology, is the use of tech of digital. You know, the the, the proverbial uh, game drive. You know, nowadays you have a, a nature guide sitting at the top of the vehicle, you know, interpreting the the nature for you. You know, you you know, you may find people wanting to adopt that. You know, in the in this whole world of isolation, as we know that the future of the future, you know, needs us a humanity to be prepared for diseases. You know, COVID nineteen could be the start, and so we need to be very prepared in terms of what the future looks like. So, so we, I see changes in technology in terms of how we're delivering our product down here, uh, the support experience that we have. Uh, the other the change for me that I also see for us in particular, and, and I'm thinking South Africa, I'm thinking. Uh, the post-colonialism, you know, the whole thing of rebalancing the economy and allowing everybody to benefit from travel, you know, uh, the shared benefits of tourism that, that it trickles down in real time. 
to communities that are living adjacent to national parks, safari reserves and game reserves. I think this is an opportunity for that, that, that to come into fruition so that everybody benefits and we begin to protect uh, nature, which is uh, you know, the, the, that what humanity need to cover going forward. And I think the, the, the last point I want to make, Loera, has got to do with the fact that we are excited, I think, uh, in the middle of all this, uh, everybody lamenting about the, the downside of what COVID has done us. But the excitement that is coming beyond adoption of, of technology is about the fact that us here in Southern Africa, space is one thing that we have in abundance. We are not as highly urbanized as you have in the States, uh, that you have in Dubai, Hala, and in the rest of Europe. And so, you know, I, there was a debate going on in the, in the media and across the world as to why the numbers of COVID infection has been low in Africa. The secret lies in the space, because at the center of, of, of our avoiding or you know, safeguarding yourself of COVID is self-isolation. So a lot of the spaces people have been to our part of the world, space is the one thing that we have been abandoned. And that is the one thing that the rest of us in the, in the continent to be able to see how do we use it to advantage going to the future. So we connect humanity back to nature. And that's where, that's the excitement for me, post COVID, whenever that period is, whenever that date that's put, the peg you put in the sand, to say this is where COVID effectively begin, stops ruling our lives, we've embraced a new normal. And we study, we think Southern Africa and Sub-Southern Africa will be right in the forefront to be able to, to derive those benefits. Well, boy, does that sound appealing, the concept of having some space right now in particular. So that, that was a great, a great uh, metaphor and oh, actually it wasn't a metaphor it's just sort of a great vision for you to share with us so thank you for sharing that and I know we're running a little bit late as my students know and my friends know that's typical for me so I apologize um, but I do want to ask each of our guests to just share some thoughts particularly for our students if you have some words of wisdom for our industry colleagues who or professionals who may be on um, I welcome that too but in particular for the students who may be wanting and they still have the passion for this industry that we all have. Um, but when we're hearing that, you know, things may not come back in the next three, four years, um, it will take some time. It's a slower recovery than we had thought maybe seven months ago. Where are there opportunities um, in hospitality and, and what kinds of suggestions you have or words of wisdom regardless. So Hala, let me start with you for the industry professionals or for the students who may be listening in today, any last thoughts that you'd like to share? I mean, you said uh, correctly, so passion for this industry. And this is what I also tell my clients when at times they have invested in every other asset class, very successful, and this is their first hotel projects. And they say, why do I do it? And that's exactly what I say the hospitality industry, tourism and hospitality in general, they're fun, creative, uh, you know, they're global. Uh, it, you know, it speaks for itself, the word hospitality. This is the language wherever you go when you end up in a hotel or in, in anything related to hospitality, there is that sense of peace. I'd go the extra mile to say, you know, it goes cross, uh, also cross borders and it is the language of peace and connecting people. But that aside, when we look at what has happened to the industry, and I've been doing this for 20 years, you know that, Laura, and I still wake up every day very excited with new projects. They just make me think through what the next project is going to be and how is it going to be different. More importantly, I am actually excited with all these changes because for a very long time also, you know, when we look at the branding and the standards and a lot of things that, you know, we've done it this way and we continue to do it this way. And I think now we're pausing, we're reflecting and at every level we're reassessing the future. The opportunities are just going to be great for people that have the creativity that are really looking to, what well, I would use probably the word transform this industry. It's about time we also transform ourselves. Every other industry has transformed in, in many different ways, yet we've had some disruptors such as Airbnb and also the third party booking platforms. But when we compare to other industries, there's much more transformation we can do. And if um, the students, the alumni or even my industry colleagues are excited to be part of this change and this transformation, this is really a good time uh, because we are in that time where we're really assessing and uh, we're looking forward. Couldn't agree more. And transformation, I think, is always a very healthy thing to be a part of, actually. I think it's growth for everybody. So thank you. Actually, Machachi, I'll go to you next. 
any words of uh, thoughts or suggestions or recommendations for our industry colleagues who may be listening or for the students who may be here today? Let me start, uh, Leora, with the, the industry colleagues. I think uh, let's look at uh, COVID-19 uh, as an opportunity uh, to reinvent ourselves, uh, specifically in our part of the world where you have many of our people who are not necessarily in the high end in terms of income, an opportunity to reinvent a product and begin to cater for them as well. We must not only always be you know, focusing on the international community to provide all these high end luxury products that are beyond people's reach. Domestic travel is here, let's embrace them, let's embrace regional travel and begin to build our own our future uh, consumer market. So for me, I think an opportunity to reinvent um, you know, out of that. For the students, Leora, uh, I think COVID-19, I see it as almost like a break, a break with the known, allowing the new to come in. And you know, so I say to the students, look through, all the things that us who've been in the industry looks at it and start saying, what if, you know, when do we get back to 2090? When do we get back? Look through that and say, where are the opportunities in this? You know, in a war, after a war, there's always, you go, somebody goes through the ashes and try to see the opportunity, the green shoots coming out of the ashes. And I think there's an opportunity for the students to be able to say, hey, listen, you're not seeing opportunity because you're so stuck up with what you know, which was in the past. Try and find the opportunity because you, in those opportunities, it's the opportunity for you as a student to build your own future. So the future is in your hands. It is not in the hands of the current generation that is running the industry. Build your own future from what is left from COVID-19. And this is a very exciting industry and uh, you can only win, you can lose in hospitality. Thank you, Machachi, that was fabulous. And Juan, I'm gonna give you the last word. How do you like that? And then we're gonna turn it over to a completely different conversation. But Juan, any thoughts? Until the COVID-19 pandemic hit, Travel and tourism represented 10% of the world's employment. One in every 10 person, people were employed by travel and leisure and, and hospitality. Hospitality has cycles. We've seen cycles. We will continue to see cycles, but I know something is that people need to travel. You cannot see Machu Picchu through Zoom. You cannot see a safari in Namibia through Zoom. And if you think you are, and just buy a TV and buy a subscription to a high definition channel, it's not the same. You're never going to be able to eat the food, talk to the people, really understand the cultures. Travel is not dead. It's very much alive. This is a short break and we will be back after the intermission. It's been a horrible intermission, but for those employed, invested in hospitality, this will come back again. You've seen cycles and will continue. For those studying, getting ready for employment, even though it's been a brutal year, you will have a job. And you might not have a job in the same place where you thought you would have it, but you will continue having jobs. So stay, you know, this shall all pass. That's my last thought. On that note, I'm going to say thank you to Hala, Machachi, and Juan very much for being with us today, for taking part of your Saturday afternoon or evening with us. Um, I'm gonna use my reaction button and, and thank you so much. It means so much to our university, to the school for you to participate. Thank you again for sharing your wisdom. We could have talked forever and thank you. Um, it means a lot to us, but if there's any message from all of this is we need the global connections to learn from each other and to continue to stay connected um, because that's what hospitality is all about. So really appreciate it and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.